What do you get if you chop up a potato and fry it in a skillet? You get a hash brown. Mmm, breakfast of champions. Okay, crazy thought. What if you did this to a digital file? In this video, we're going to talk about hash functions. Like encryption itself, hash functions are an extremely important cryptographic primitive that you use every day. If you haven't already done so, go back and check out our videos on block ciphers and semantic security. All right, let's start with a scenario. Imagine that you wanted to download the latest release of your favorite operating system. A lot of the speed of the internet today is built around providing files to people locally via cloud servers. So you go and you download the latest release of your OS from your local cloud server, and you might naturally have a question, which is, is this the authentic copy of the operating system? Well, one thing you could do is download the software from the developers themselves and then compare the two copies to see if they're equal. Obviously, this is not very efficient. You do double the download, you spend twice the hard drive real estate, and you spend twice the time. And it kind of defeats the purpose of having a cloud infrastructure to make the internet faster. So to make things more efficient, you could just check part of the file instead of the whole thing. You could ask the developer to send you the first few bits and the last few bits of this large file, and then you could compare them to what you downloaded from the cloud server. Now, obviously, if you're worried about malware, this is not a good solution. The malware creators could just leave the first few and last few bits intact and change the middle instead. We need something that's going to look at every single bit in the file. Well, we already have functions that do this, error correcting codes. When you store a file on a computer, the bits can get corrupted by electromagnetic fields or cosmic radiation. So there's a robust literature around error correcting codes to detect and recover from situations like this. But there's a problem. These error correcting codes were designed to handle natural phenomena. They follow a statistical distribution. They're not trying to cleverly and adaptively modify the file in order to beat the error correcting code. But in our world, the attacker is, and we have to provide some kind of mechanism that will prevent them from doing that. Okay, so here's an idea. What if there was a way that we could take some arbitrary blob of data and associate it uniquely with some kind of short fixed fingerprint or avatar. In this example, we're using the Identicon algorithm to create an image from a string of data. If you have an account on GitHub, you might recognize these graphics. Okay, so going back to our OS example, the user can download the fingerprint from the developers instead of the file itself. So if we can come up with some kind of algorithm to create unique or mostly unique fingerprints, then the attackers won't be able to create another file with the malware in it that shares the same fingerprint. Cryptographic hashes are kind of a big deal. They're used all over the internet for many different applications. For example, the data fingerprinting application that we just described, it can be used to fingerprint source code, like if you use Git or GitHub. It can be used to identify malicious files. It's used in intrusion detection. And it's even used by law enforcement to establish chain of custody of hard drive images. Hashing is also used as an efficiency method for digital signatures. If we have to do a really costly public key operation, what if we could do it on a short fixed length string instead of your big old blob of data? As we'll see in the next video, they can also be used to create message authentication codes, which are essential for proving the integrity of data sent across the internet. And as we'll see in later videos, hash functions are used to derive subkeys in the TLS protocol. We can take a master secret and we can use it to create multiple different sub secrets. We'll also see in later videos how hash functions are used in secure password storage. The idea is instead of storing the password itself, you store the hash of the password. That way, if your server gets owned and your password database gets dumped out on the darknet somewhere, it won't be immediately obvious what everyone's password is. At least that's the idea. Hashes are used on the internet all day long, but perhaps the most prolific use of hashes is in the Bitcoin proof of work. The idea is 
you're iterating a hash function over and over again until it produces a particular pattern. The first person to find that pattern wins the block bounty. You're basically solving a puzzle. You're proving that you did some work. And this proof of work methodology is how Bitcoin establishes consensus in the blockchain. Hashes also show up in more advanced applications like non-interactive zero-knowledge proofs with something called the Fiat Shamir heuristic. Hashes are also resistant to cryptanalysis by quantum computers, which is a big deal, I guess, if you could actually build a quantum computer. And of course, they show up in all kinds of secure protocols for private record linkage and exact matching and all over the place. So what is a hash function? At its core, a hash function is just some function that takes arbitrary length inputs and maps them to fixed length outputs. Before we can move on, we've got to get a bit of terminology out of the way. A hash function accepts as input elements from a set. We call this set the domain. And the elements that are living in this set, we call those the pre-images. The hash function outputs elements from a set. We call this set the codomain. Elements of the codomain are called the images. So hash function maps pre-images from the domain to images in the codomain. But then again, so does any function. The difference here is that elements of the domain have arbitrary length, whereas elements of the codomain are fixed. If you have an L-bit hash function, the output is L bits long. All right, let's look at a basic hash function. We're just going to take inputs modulo 256. So we're taking arbitrary length input strings, we're casting them to integers, and then we're taking them modulo 256, which is going to provide us with a fixed length 8-bit output. But from a cryptography perspective, you can see a problem here, and it's very straightforward. Similar pre-images map to similar images. So going back to our operating system example, if we had some kind of nice linear relationship like this, we might be able to insert our malware and then maybe change a few other bits to induce it to go to the intended hash value. So this is not going to work for us. We need our hash function to be more random looking. So that brings us to the notion of what's called a cryptographic hash function. There's lots of people all throughout the computer science literature talking about hash functions of one form or another. Those are just functions that take a big arbitrary length input and map it to a fixed length output. But a cryptographic hash function has a special property. It models something called a pseudo-random function. Imagine you had a function where the outputs were chosen completely at random. This is what a pseudo-random function is trying to model. An ideal cryptographic hash function is something we call a random oracle. Okay, here's how this works. The random oracle will create its lookup table. Every single pre-image will be listed in the table, and next to it is the associated image. Now, how are these images chosen? Well, they're chosen at random. So you can think of it as the oracle literally flipping a sequence of eight coins and then writing down that result. Now, it doesn't flip the coins every time you ask it. It flips it only once. So if you give it the same pre-image again, it'll give you back the same image every time. The point is, it was chosen completely at random. And more importantly, the images were generated completely independently of each other. Each one was a random coin toss. So if you have two pre-images that are somehow related to one another, it doesn't matter because the images were generated completely randomly and independently from one another. But guess what? Random oracles don't actually exist in the real world. If we're trying to create a function that maps infinitely many inputs to some fixed length output, we're going to need a table with infinitely many entries. Now you might say, well, maybe we could just approximate an oracle by bounding the input somehow. Maybe we'll only allow the input to be, you know, k bits long. The problem is this is still an exponential function. A k bit input length still requires 2 to the power of k many entries. 
So in order to operate at cryptographic levels, we're going to need more memory than we can possibly store. So in practice, what we do is we try to kind of simulate or fake the random oracle by using highly nonlinear functions. The idea is we want the functions to be difficult to invert and hard to find relationships between similar inputs. So what we really need our cryptographic hash function to do is provide three important security properties. The first property is called pre-image resistance. If you gave me an image of a hash function, it should be hard for me to go searching through the pre-image space to find some value that hashed to the image that you gave me. Basically, it should be hard to go backwards. Similarly, if you gave me a pre-image, it should be hard for me to find a second pre-image that hashes to the same value. And finally, it should be hard to find any two values that hash to the same value. We call those collisions. All right, let's look at pre-image resistance. Remember, what we're saying is that if you are given an image, it should be hard to find a pre-image that hashes to that image. So the natural question that we have is, what is the probability that you can find a pre-image for a given image if the hash function is modeling a random oracle? Now remember, the random oracle is assigning the outputs randomly. So there's really going to be no efficient way to describe the inverse of this function. That is to say, it's going to be really hard to go backwards. However, it's easy to go forwards, so what you can do is try essentially a brute force search. You could pick a random element out of the pre-image space and hash it and see if it reaches your target image. And since the output was generated by a random oracle, any guess that you make about the pre-image will map to the particular image you're looking for with probability 1 over 2 to the power of L. Now if we work this through, we see that an L-bit hash function provides L bits of pre-image resistance. So what we're saying is that in order to find a pre-image for a given image, we're going to expect to have to do on the order of two to the power of L different guesses. And L doesn't have to be very big before that becomes a lot of work. Now the analysis of second pre-image resistance runs along the same lines. Again, that means that we're going to expect to have to do on the order of two to the power of L different guesses until we can find that second pre-image. Now collision resistance is a little bit more complicated. If I'm just picking random pre-images, what's the probability that they will hash to the same image? Well, the analysis here is based off of something called the birthday paradox. The birthday paradox asks a simple question. How many people do you need to put in a room together before you expect that some pair of people in that room will share a birthday? We're going to assume that every birthday is equally likely, although in practice that's not actually true. The reason it's called the birthday paradox is because that number is much lower than you might expect. Although there are 365 days in the year, you only need to get 23 people into a room together before you can expect that some pair in that room share their birthday. The analysis of the birthday problem is a little bit complicated, but you can go watch this video if you're interested. The long and short of it is that if you have an L bit hash function, it will provide you with L divided by two bits of security. So what we're saying there is that if you have an L bit cryptographic hash function, you're going to have to try two to the power of L divided by two pairs of pre-images before you would expect to find a pair that hash to the same value. Okay, so here's an example of some commonly used hash functions and their respective output lengths L. So as an exercise, suppose that you were requiring 128 bits of pre-image resistance, which of these hash functions would be suitable for your use, assuming they behaved like a random oracle? Similarly, if you needed 128 bits of collision resistance, which of these hash functions would be suitable? Again, assuming that they were behaving like a random oracle. Okay, all this talk about ideal properties of hash functions, let's go look at a real hash function in action. You can start by flipping open a Python console. And if you don't have Python installed, go install Python, it's awesome. 
Python 3 comes jam-packed with a whole bunch of really awesome hash functions for you to try. Real hash functions accept bits as input, so if you want to input an ASCII string, you have to encode it as a byte string first. Fortunately, Python 3 makes this a total breeze. Now in this example, I've output the hash values and displayed them as hexadecimal characters, but again, they are being output as raw bits. Now the important property to notice here is that if I hash similar messages, they produce very different looking hash values. Similarly, if I hash the same message using different hash functions, I'm also going to get different hash values. In this example, you can see hash functions with differing output lengths. At the top, we have MD5 with only 128 bits of output, and on the bottom, we have SHA-512 and Blake2B, which are outputting 512 bits of output. Okay, so this is pretty cool. MD5, the prolific hash function from the 90s, is broken. And by that, I mean that we can produce collisions in faster than brute force. Remember, MD5 has a 128-bit output length. So if it was behaving like a random oracle, you would expect to have to do 2 to the power of 128 divided by 2, 64, pairs of hashes in order to expect to find a collision. Now remember I said that real hash functions are trying to emulate random oracles through the use of nonlinear functions. And as it turns out, MD5's function has some linearities in it that people can exploit to produce collisions in much less than brute force. This is a really interesting example, and you can go hash it yourself to see. These two messages are actually different. The differences are shown in the red characters. But they hash to the same value. Oops. Okay, so there's just a couple of last points to make about hash functions. The first point is just to remember that hashing is deterministic. You give it the same input over and over again, and it will give you the same output every time. Now this leads us to an obvious second point. It should be very obvious, and yet somehow it isn't. And that is that hashing is not encryption. Don't get confused. There's no decryption function, and there's no key. I'm telling you, I hear people in industry mess this one up all the time. They talk about encrypting numbers when they mean to say that they're hashing them. So please, don't be that person. And finally, every hash function has collisions. If we have arbitrarily many messages and we're placing them into a fixed number of bins, sooner or later, some bin is going to have more than one message in it. This is called the pigeonhole principle. And this is one way, again, that hash functions are not like encryption. Remember, with encryption, decryption has to be guaranteed and unique. Here, it's entirely possible that any given hash value will have multiple messages that map to it. All right, so that's it for this video. Go out and see if you can find hash values kicking around the internet. They're all over the place. In the next video, we're going to look at something called message authentication codes. Once again, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to click like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.